Well, hello, friends. Uh, it is good to be here this morning. Uh, I want to welcome all of you heavily caffeinated people. Um, any of you, did anybody come in from the East Coast and struggle with that thing where you wake up at three in the morning and there's absolutely nothing to do? But I want to start a, start a coffee shop on the West Coast for East Coasters who come to the West Coast. It's only available from three to five in the morning. That's it. It's the only time. Uh, it is really great to be with you this morning. And I, am, uh, I want to thank Kat for inviting me to come and to speak and to share in what I think is a very wonderful um, conversation that needs to be happening. And, and I want to talk, and we're going to move from inspiration to action today. I want to talk about some very practical things we can do to begin building practices into our lives to help us deal with the pressures and the uncertainties that we face on a daily basis. So I've been sp the, spent the last several years of my life studying creativity and innovation, but a very specific kind of creativity, this creativity among those who have to go to work every day, who have to solve problems, who have to figure it out every day. How many of you have to solve problems on a daily basis as a function of your job? How many of you solve other people's problems every day? All right, one more question. How many of you had a specific person in mind when I asked that last question? <laughs> That's what we do, right? As creatives, we solve problems. But in the midst of that, in the midst of solving problems every day, there are a unique set of pressures that we're often ill-equipped to deal with. And as leaders in organizations, those, those pressures, how we deal with those pressures can trickle down to the rest of our team. So we have to be very careful to make sure that we're building practices to help us deal effectively with those pressures so that we can set the tone, establish the playground for the rest of our team. Now, when we talk about things like creativity, we talk about innovation. I know for some of us who are very tactically minded, very strategically minded, right, our eyes maybe start to glaze over a little bit like, okay, we're going to talk about the soft stuff. We're going to talk about the sort of the, the, the less tangible side of what we do. So I want to point you to the universally recognized MSOW spectrum to let you know exactly how ineffable we're going to get today in our conversation, which is, of course, the Mr. Spock Oprah Winfrey spectrum. <laughs> And we're going to land somewhere right about there, okay? So no worries, we are going to get tactical, but we have to talk about some of the softer side of what we do, the ineffable side, in order to effectively deal with these dynamics. Also, if you go to toddhenry.com 3%, you can download my slides from today. Also, a conversation I have with some great creative leaders about how to be more effective collaborators and a workbook for my first book, The Accidental Creative. All right, so a couple of years ago, my family and I made a trip to Lake Erie for the 4th of July. We're uh, from Ohio. No whoops. It's okay. That's all right. I can take it. It's fine. Uh, we're from Ohio. And uh, so we were making a trip down to the lake for the fireworks. And as we started packing up our children to head down to the lake, our middle child, Owen, our six-year-old, starts protesting, screaming, I'm not going to go to the lake. You can't make me go to the fireworks. And like a good dad, of course, I said, shut up and get in the wagon. Right? So we put him in the wagon. We start walking down to the lake. As we get closer and closer to the lake, Owen starts protesting again. He jumps out of the wagon. He starts running the opposite direction. All right, so now I'm chasing my wailing son through the streets of town. This looks really good, by the way. I finally catch up with him. I put my arms on his shoulders and I say, Owen, son, it's okay. The fireworks aren't going to fall on you. They're perfectly safe. It's okay. And he said, Dad, I'm not worried they're going to fall on me. Duh. Right? I said, well, what's going on? I don't understand. He said, Dad, fireworks make my feet fuzzy. First, I turned to my wife and said, did you drop him on his head? What's going on? Is there, yeah. uh, I said, what do you mean? They make your feet fuzzy. And, and he said, yeah, like at Disney World. Okay, I solve creative problems for a living. This is what I do, right? So I've got four disparate bits of data. I've got wailing child, I've got fuzzy feet, I've got fireworks, and now I've got thrown into the mix of Disney World. So I'm crunching in my brain trying to figure out what the heck is this kid talking about, right? And I remember the last time Owen saw fireworks was on a family trip to Disney World, right? Click, okay, that makes sense. So now I'm replaying in my brain the scene from Disney World, trying to figure out what the heck is he talking about? And I remember that it was really hot that day. As I'm recalling that day, Owen spent most of the time riding around on my shoulders. So we're walking around the park for a couple of hours. We walk in front of the castle, and this is the climactic moment when the fireworks go off. It suddenly occurred to me what was going on in his six-year-old mind. What happens when you spend a couple of hours riding around on someone's shoulders, what happens to your legs? They fall asleep, something that hadn't occurred to him until his fireworks-induced startle, right? So my son walked around for a year with the assumption that fireworks make his legs immobile. <laughs> so we had a little talk about causation and correlation. I don't think he got it, right? But I started thinking shortly thereafter about how often I do a similar thing in my work and how often the teams, the companies I work with, do a similar thing. We experience something. Let's call it a success. Right? 
And so because we are biologically hardwired to replicate those successes, we go back to the same wells of inspiration over and over and over, back to the same systems over and over and over. And pretty soon those assumptions that we're making about what works and what doesn't become habits. And those habits become systems and those systems become ruts. And pretty soon we're operating from a place of being fossilized around these assumptions, fossilized in such a way that it's impossible for us to see to the left, to the right. We're not looking in the places where brilliant ideas reside. And as leaders, it's easy for us to become fossilized and lead our team right down that same path. We have to be careful to make sure that we are structuring our lives, our organizations in such a way that we're looking in those really valuable places, that we're not becoming complacent, that we're not settling. Why does this happen? Why do we get to a place eventually over time, if we're in this rut, to a place of mediocrity? in life and in work. This seems to be the tendency in the, in, the, in the marketplace that eventually, no matter how brilliant of a trajectory we're on, eventually organizations, individuals roll to the middle of the bed. They settle into the grooves. That just seems to be the tendency. Why do people settle into a place of mediocrity? Now this word mediocrity comes from two words in the original language, medius, meaning middle, and ochrus, meaning rugged mountain. So to be mediocre literally means to stop halfway up a rugged mountain. It means to stop halfway to your objective, to get halfway up and say, close enough. I'm going to settle in. Why does this happen to so many bright, sharp, amazing, talented, creative people? Why? Why do we settle medius ochres? Why do we say, eh, close enough? And I know enough about the people in this room to know that that is not your profile. That is not what you're aspiring to. And yet... And yet, if you don't build some practices to deal with the dynamics that we face every day, eventually you will get worn down. It's the way things happen. So, why does this happen? I believe it's because of the, the, the oppressive force of uncertainty. The force of uncertainty that, that says, you know what, no matter what you do, there's no guaranteed, on the, on the other side, no guaranteed result on the other side of your effort. And so, as a result, over time, it's easy for us to simply get worn down by this uncertainty. So what we have to do is we have to recognize that there are actually three kinds of work that we must do. We have to do three kinds of work in order to stay in a place where we're productive, where we're growing, where we're contributive, and where we're creating an environment for our organizations where they can do the same. The first kind of work is mapping. And this is pretty much what it sounds like. It's planning. We all know we have to plan. We know we have to strategize. It's the work before the work. The second kind is making. And this is actually doing what we plan. We plan, we do, we plan, we do. And this is how most of us think about work, right? We plan, we do, we strategize, we execute. But there's a third kind of work that we often ignore, especially in the midst of uncertainty, especially when we're under pressure. And we ignore it at our peril, to our detriment. And it's what I call meshing. And meshing is the work between the work. It's little things you're doing like aligning yourself with productive passion. It's little things like developing yourself, developing your mind, engaging in behavior that isn't efficient in the moment, but is effective in the long term. But these are the things that we ignore when we're under pressure. Right? Now, depending on how we engage under pressure, we can fall into a couple of profiles. There are people I call drivers. And these are, these are people who, under pressure, ignore meshing. They map and they make. They plan and they do. They are get it done people. Get the hell out of my way. I'm going to walk through you like a brick wall. If you do not get out of my way, I'm going to, like a dog with a bone, right? My objective. How many of you would self-diagnose as possibly being a driver under pressure? I am a get-it-done person. I will walk through you. Do not get in my way, right? That's what drivers do. But the problem with drivers is this. The problem with drivers is that we're often not doing the little things that are preparing us not just to take advantage of today's opportunities, but to be able to take advantage of tomorrow's opportunities. And so over time, it's easy for drivers to become decreasingly effective. They go through cycles of crash, burn, refresh, re-engage, crash, burn, refresh, re-engage. And unfortunately for some of us, that's just kind of how, that's the mindset we've adopted. This is just the way it is. It's the way it goes in the creative services industry. Right? The second profile we can fall into under pressure is what I call the drifter. And the drifter is the person who under pressure lacks the conviction of a strategic plan. So they're always bouncing from shiny object to shiny object. Squirrel, right? That's what they do. The, the, whatever gives them the, the biggest ping in their environment. And so they lack the conviction of a strategic plan. Does anybody else fall into that profile under pressure? You tend to drift? Yeah, that's, I need to have people around me who keep me aligned around a long-term objective. 
And in organizations, I have to make sure that there are people around me to keep me aligned because I will bounce from shiny object to shiny object if I'm not careful under pressure. And the third profile we can fall into is when we mesh, meaning we're doing the work between the work and we map. We're good at planning, but we never actually get around to doing the work. Under pressure, we, we become paralyzed under pressure. Uh, out here in San Francisco, we call these idea people. I have a great idea. It's the next Facebook. It's going to be great. Will you please build it for me? Right? No, right? These are people who, under pressure, they don't make. And this isn't going to work for us. And of course, the profile we want to develop is what I call being a developer, meaning we have practices in our life to help us map, to help us make, and to help us mesh so that we're staying focused, we're staying engaged, we're engaging in contributive behavior. We're doing things that are inefficient in the moment, but effective over the long term. And the ultimate goal, and this is the main thing I think we need to take away this morning, is that we want to be prolific, bless you, we want to be prolific, not prolific, brush, bless you. We want to be prolific, we want to be brilliant, and we want to be healthy. But we want to do these all at the same time. Prolific meaning we're doing a lot of work. How many of us have to do a lot of work in the function of our job? Like, yes, we do, right? Brilliant meaning we, have, we want to do good work. We have to do good work. But we also want to be healthy, meaning that we're engaging in work in a way that we're going to be able to sustain it over the long term. We're making investments in our future. We're not just strip mining the present at the expense of the future. Instead, we're making investments in the future on a daily basis so that we're increasing in our capacity to do great work. In other words, we're operating with rhythm in our lives. Not balance. Balance is a myth. We're operating with rhythm in our lives. And of course, it's easy to get two of these three right. We can be prolific, meaning we're doing a lot of work. We can be brilliant, meaning we're doing good work, but miss on the healthy piece, miss on the sustainability piece. There's a technical term I coined for these people, and it's fried. <laughs> these are the walking zombies that haunt our hallways. Okay? And of course, we can be healthy, meaning we've got the rhythm piece figured out. We can be brilliant, meaning we're doing good work, but we're not producing at a rate that's consistent with client or marketplace demand. And these people are unreliable. They can't be counted on to deliver when it matters most. And we all know those people we don't really want on our project team. Right? None of them are in this room, of course, but we know those people because they can't be counted on. And that's not going to work for us. Of course, just to close the loop, we can be prolific, meaning we're doing a lot of work, and we can be healthy, meaning we've figured out the sustainability piece. But our work is terrible. It's awful. And there's a technical term I've coined for these people, and it's fired. Because you're not going to keep your job for very long if you're not doing consistently great work. So, friends, I ask you this morning, how are you doing on this matrix of prolific, brilliant, and healthy? Are you firing on all cylinders or are you missing one or more? Because, listen, as leaders, how you do on this will trickle down to your entire organization. It will. How you structure your life, how you structure your rhythms will trickle down to the entire organization. You have to be a model of prolific, brilliant, and healthy if you want to have an organization that's firing on all cylinders. And this is not just, by the way, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we all just you know, gallop through the tulips all day, creating things, and no, this is good for business. It is good for business. It is expensive to hire people, to train them, to build client relationships, and then to have to go through a cycle of doing that again because people burn out, because people fry, because they can't sustain. This is good for business. 75%, according to a recent survey sponsored by Adobe, conducted by Strategy One, 75% of creative professionals worldwide reported they feel they're not living up to their creative potential. They feel they're not engaging in a way uh, that they could be engaging if their circumstances were different. 75%. And I believe this is largely because we exist in a create-on-demand world. Not only are we accountable for this mystical, ineffable force called creativity, but also we have to deliver results by tomorrow at noon on time, on budget, in order to keep our job. Thank you very much. That's what we have to do. So how do we begin to deal with these pressures? And how do we avoid hitting the wall over time? Well, the first step is we have to identify what I call the assassins of creativity and how they can play out in our organizations and begin to rob us of our passion, our engagement, our focus, our drive. We have to identify these and then we can build practices to countermand them. The ass assassins are stealthy. They're like ninjas. They are. They sneak into your lives, into your organizations, and they assassinate your drive, your passion, your focus from the inside out. And over time, we begin to settle medius ochris. Unwittingly. There are three of them I want to address quickly, and then we're going to talk about some really practical stuff we can do to begin countermanding them. The first is what I call dissonance. Dissonance is when there's a gap between the why and the what. 
of our work. And dissonance is used in a lot of contexts, used in music to describe two notes that are played together that don't quite go together. So you're watching a scene, of, let's say it's a film, you're watching a film, it's a beautiful sunny day, the birds are chirping, there's a woman, she's walking through her apartment, the sun is shining, but you just know the serial killer is hiding in the bathroom. How do you know that? Typically it's because there's a bed of music playing just beneath the surface of the film. Kind of a dissonant bed of music that makes you feel uneasy. It makes you feel like something's not right. And I would submit to you that many of us have a similar bed of music playing just beneath the surface of our lives and our organizations. Something is misaligned, but we haven't quite put our finger on what it is. There are a couple of sources of dissonance we have to be aware of. The first is illustrated by this video of my children. Um, these are my three children. The youngest, Ava, is uh, she's in a, the, the red dress. Um, total free spirit, by the way. Don't fence me in, man, right? Young, youngest child. Our oldest, Ethan, in the striped shirt, total firstborn rule follower behavior. They're going to have a race here in a minute, and you're going to see in just a second, Ava, the free spirit, is going to throw her arms up and say, I win. I win the race. I am the champion, right? And Ethan, who's the rule follower, is going to say, what do you mean? What are you talking about? You win. Where was the starting line? Where was the finish line? What were the terms of engagement? Right? <laughs> Typical firstborn rule follower behavior. And it seems silly in this context, but I would submit to you that many of us go through our lives and go through our work in a similar manner. We don't define the edges of our work, the starting point, the ending point, and we get carried along by our work instead of defining it. They're about to assault one another, so I'm going to move on before I get in trouble. Okay? <laughs> so we have to learn to define the edges. The second source of dissonance is what I call unnecessary complexity. This is a, a formula I hung on the outside of my office door after I tanked my first creative team by driving them over a cliff. Not literally, I didn't drive, but I, I drove them over a cliff. Why, do I, why did I drive them over a cliff? Because I love complexity. Complexity feels like progress to me. It does, right? Give me something, give me a problem. I will hand you back a beautifully complex thing and I'll say, look at this, look how beautiful it is. No, it's not beautiful, it's just complex. Complexity is not progress. Progress is progress. So we have to be careful to make sure we're eliminating unnecessary complexity because every point of complexity in our, how we direct our team, in our expectations of our team, in how we define projects, and how we define what it is we want people to do, every point of complexity is an opportunity for dissonance to emerge. Now work is complex, but we have to simplify it as much as we can. So where in your life is there unnecessary complexity in how you're engaging in your behavior? And the third source of dissonance is what I call the opacity phenomenon. And this is when all of the why-based decisions are made in some kind of black box. And then someone comes out to the rest of the organization and says, you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. And they go back into the black box and everybody's left saying, why are we doing this? I don't understand. What's the why behind what you expect me to spend myself on? If we want to get the best work out of our teams and we want the best work out of ourselves, we have to align the why and the what of our work. Because where there is a lack of story, people will invent a story to go there. And that's how teams begin to dissolve. That's when dissonance begins to emerge. So how are you doing at aligning your team behind why the work is important? We'll talk about how to do that in just a minute. The second assassin is fear. Fear. There's a guy named Neil Fiore who does experiments with procrastination. Uh, and he will often take people into a room like this and put a wood plank on the floor, 10 feet long, 6 inches wide. And he'll ask the people, could you walk the length of this plank on the floor if I ask you to? And they'll look at him like, well, of course, it's a wood plank on the floor, right? I'd have to be drunk not to be able to walk the plank. Great. Now imagine I take that plank and I suspend it 100 feet in the air between two buildings. Now could you walk the length of that plank? And they'll look at the imaginary plank and they'll look at him and they'll say, no way, I'd have to be drunk. Are you kidding me? No way am I walking a wood plank 100 feet in the air. Well, what's changed about the technical skill required? Absolutely nothing. If you can do it on the ground, you can do it in the air. What's changed are the perceived consequences of failure, which in this case is plummeting to your death, so I kind of get it, right? But I would submit to you that many of us go through our days artificially escalating planks, artificially escalating the perceived consequences of failure to the point that we don't act and we tell ourselves stories about what's going to happen if we act, if we take risks that are simply not based in reality. See, fear turns something innocuous into something terrifying. That's what fear does. But once we bring fear out into the light, we begin talking about true risk, true consequence, rather than perceived consequence, rather than living in the world of our head, we start talking about it as a team 
we tend to begin to neuter fear. We begin to, to, uh, to, cause, to remove its sting. Okay? The third sort of uh, assassin we have to, to deal with is expectation escalation, which looks something like this. Hey, great job hitting your objective. That was fantastic. Not only did you hit it, you exceeded it by, let's call it 20%. That was great. By the way, 120% is your new baseline. Hey, way to exceed that 120%. Good job. By the way, 150%, now your new baseline. Okay. And we are really, really good at squeezing white space out of our organizations, at maximizing efficiency at the expense of effectiveness. We have to be careful not to allow expectation escalation to rob us of our engagement. Because when we do that, our team comes in to do something very simple, and it starts to feel like this. As leaders, we are culpable. We have to make sure that we are building platforms and building a playground in which our teams can thrive. And we're not squeezing every last ounce of white space because innovation happens in the white space. Creativity happens in the white space. That's where brilliant ideas emerge. So how do we avoid hitting the wall? Let's talk about some specific things that we can do, specific practices we can build into our lives. These are what I call the, the elements of rhythm, the five areas of rhythm that we can build, in which we can build practices to help us begin to engage more meaningfully. And also that we can build practices so that our teams can engage more meaningfully in our work. The first is focus. Focus is about how we define the work. We have a finite amount of attention. It doesn't feel like it, we don't act like it, but we have a finite amount of attention to spend on our work and on the world around us. We do, and I believe ultimately we will be remembered, each of us will be remembered for the battles we choose to spend our time fighting, for the places we choose to spend that finite attention that we have, very finite attention we have at our disposal. But focus is hard to come by these days, and there are many reasons why that is the case. The first is this little dynamic I like to call the ping. And the ping is this perpetual pinprick in my gut that says something like, you should go check your email right now. You should go check your Twitter feed right now. You should go check your phone because maybe the President of the United States is calling you with a national security crisis. Right? That's the level of urgency the ping delivers. And the ping, by the way, has a life philosophy for you and for me. The life philosophy of the ping is something out there might be more important than what's in front of you. Something out there might be more important than what's in front of you. And it has us living in this state that Linda Stone calls continuous partial attention. I'm always kind of here, but I'm always kind of somewhere else at the same time. Do you think we can do our best work that way? No. I would submit to you that the ping is robbing us of our ability to fully engage, to fully bring the capacity of our mind against the problems we're trying to solve. Productivity writer Merlin Mann calculated if you check your email every five minutes over the course of an average workday, now some of us are like five minutes, try every five seconds. How many of you get that phantom buzzing thing in your leg where you think your phone is ringing, but it's not? Yeah, we are telekinetically connected to our tech. Now, how many of you have checked your work email outside of work hours at some point in the last week? Ah, please, right? Let's be a little more vulnerable. How many of you have checked your email since I started my presentation, right? How many of you have checked it since I started talking about the ping? I mean, the all ping. Yeah, I should check my email right now, right? We are, we are living in a world of constantly fractured attention. So Merlin calculated, if you do that every five minutes over the course of an average work day, over a course of a year, you will check your email 24,000 times. 24,000 times, what do we do other than breathe? 24,000 times a year. But we are enslaved to our technology, to whatever is out there. The ping's life philosophy is something out there might be more important than what's in front of you. So you better hedge your bets. So I took this a step further and I calculated if every time you do that, let's say it takes you 10 seconds to regain your depth of focus. Now most experts would say anywhere from 30 seconds to 20 minutes to really regain your depth of focus. But let's say it takes you 10 seconds. Over the course of an average year, you will spend 66.6 .6 hours not doing anything about your email, not even going into it, just glancing to see if something out there is more important than what's in front of you. 66.6 .6 hours. Now we've done a couple of things here. First of all, 666, we've proven email is evil. There you go, you're welcome. <laughs> but second of all, how many of us struggle to feel like we have the time, the focus, the energy, the attention we need to dedicate to our most important work? And yet we think nothing of slicing up our life 10 seconds at a time and giving it away to the ping. We have to learn to tame the ping. If we don't, we are like a drunken, blindfolded archer trying to hit a target. Seriously, we are. 
That's what fractured attention does to us. It's like blindfolding us, spinning us around, and telling us to hit a target. It's going to be really difficult for us to do so. But that's not the only reason that focus is difficult. Another reason focus is difficult is because we have swirling objectives. By way of illustrating this, I'm going to do a social experiment. I'm going to put five cards up on the screen, and I want everyone to choose one card. Just focus on one card. I'm going to mind meld with you, OK? Nod your head when you have your card. All right, I'm going to remove the five cards. I'm going to shuffle them. I'm going to remove one of them, put it in my back pocket. I'm going to put four of those cards back up on the screen. How many people see your card? Nobody? Two people? Greatest magic trick ever. Actually, these are four entirely different cards than the ones I put up the first time. <laughs> those of you who raise your hand, come see me. I have people I can refer you to. It's fine. <laughs> Why does this trick work? It works because I gave you a problem to solve, and most of you perform brilliantly, with a few exceptions. You perform brilliantly <laughs> on the task, but in so doing, you ignored the context. You ignored what was going on around the problem I gave you, and in so doing, you solved the problem, but you solved the wrong problem. And this is endemic, by the way, in creative services. We solve problems. We are very good at solving problems, but are we solving the right problem? Are we focused on the right thing? Are we paying attention to the context? So how do we do that? We have to define our through line. We have to figure out the connective tissue that ties our work together. As you're leading your team, how do you define that through line for your team? This is what we are spinning ourselves on behalf of. Or another way to put this is you have to identify your productive passion. Now this word passion, I think is often misused in our culture because we use it to, for anything we are mildly interested in. I am passionate, I am so passionate about gelato, and I am passionate about good espresso, and I am passionate about freedom, and I am passionate about my spouse or significant other, right? We can all see that those are clearly different things. We misuse this word passion. The word passion in the original root form comes from the word pati, which means to suffer. To suffer. So I find it helpful to reclaim the original meaning of the word passion and to ask ourselves, what work am I willing to suffer on behalf of? What am I willing to spend myself on behalf of? What is my productive passion? What is the thing I'm going to put my shoulder to the wheel? We're going to make this happen. We're going to spend ourselves. We might die on the hill, but we are going to spend ourselves making this happen because it is so important. It's worth me suffering on behalf of, if need be. You see, I think when we talk about passion for work, we often talk about, I want to enjoy the tasks I do all day. I want to enjoy the things I get to do, which is why so many of us bounce from job to job to job. Well, I didn't like it all the time, so it must not be my passion which I think is the opposite of how we need to think about it. And by the way, those of you who lead people, lead teams of people, you need to reframe this for them as well. You're not always going to love everything you get to do, but there is something transcendent. There is something we are working toward that is worth more than enjoying the tasks. Now, we'll get to enjoy some of them. That's great. Fantastic. And we should hopefully over time work our way into a place where we are enjoying more and more of what we do. That's great. But only if we're attached to a through line, a productive passion that drives us. So what is that for you? What is the outcome that you are committed to individually and as a team? What is your productive passion? What are you spending yourselves on behalf of? If we don't do this, it's not going to happen. What is that for you and what is that for your team? And by the way, you can do that on a project by project basis as well. And you can do that by defining challenges. So define a challenge or a problem statement for every single project you do that ties back to that productive passion. Here's why this is important. I'm not just asking you to do a bunch of tasks or complete a project. Not a, you're not a blind, blindfolded, drunk archer. I'm giving you something specific. Here's why this is important. Close the gap between the why and the what. What are you committed to? What are you spending yourself on behalf of? What is your productive passion? So that's the first element is focus. And once we begin to identify that, we can tie all of our activity back to that and make sure we're spending our finite attention in meaningful ways. The second element is relationships. Relationships. We need strong relationships if we want to produce consistently great work. Now, there's a myth of the lone innovator, a myth of the lone ranger, the myth of the person out there doing great work on their own. And it is a complete and utter myth. No one does brilliant work except in the context of community, a network of people, keeping them aligned, keeping them focused, helping them see aspects of themselves they don't recognize on their own. So how do we begin to do this? I love how one of my favorite thinkers, Kierkegaard, talked about this dynamic of 
collapsing into groups, folding into groups. He said, by forming a party, by melting into some group, we avoid not only conscience, but martyrdom. This is why fear of others dominates this world. No one dares to be a genuine self. Everyone is hiding in some kind of togetherness. It's easy to find groups that will reinforce what you already think. We need relationships who challenge us to get outside of ourselves, to see the world in new ways. We have to come out of hiding. We have to put our guns on the table. What does that mean? That means in many of our organizations, the moment somebody speaks disconfirming truth, what's the first thing that happens? We get defensive. I spoke in Texas about a week and a half ago. I said, literally, for some of you, please put your guns on the table, right? When you, we get defensive. We get defensive. We don't like it when people speak truth to us, but we have to create an environment in our organizations with our relationships where we can speak truth to one another. So what does this mean? I'm going to give you five essentials or principles as leaders that we can instill with our teams to make sure that we're clearing the air for authentic relationships. The first is be a laser, not a lighthouse. What does that mean? A lighthouse says, don't go here, don't go there. Don't go here, don't go there. It's a defensive tool. We can't afford to play defense as leaders. We have to be on the offense. We don't want to be an offensive tool. That's a totally different thing. We want to be offensive, offensive, meaning we want to give clear direction, even in the midst of uncertainty. The second thing is we want to encourage dissent and foster discontent. What does this mean? Well, there's a myth in among leadership and among, uh, in the, out in the industry that tranquility equals health. Look how healthy this team is. They're so tranquil. They never argue. No, they're incredibly dysfunctional because nobody's speaking their mind. We need to create an environment where people feel free to dissent. But, but here's the thing. We're arguing about ideas, not about personality. That's where the dysfunction comes from. We want to create an environment where we're arguing about ideas. And as a leader, you have to set the tone for that. Defend your team to the death. To the death. What does this mean? This means the fastest path to irrelevancy as a leader is to sell out your team. Throw them under the bus. If you're the leader, you get to take the most arrows. Defend your team to the death. Create an environment of accountability and transparency. Think backward forward. Don't just think, what have you done for me lately? But constantly be tying back to the past accomplishments of team members. And then finally, be clear even when you're uncertain. There are going to be times when you don't know the right direction because the uncertainty is palpable. It's swirling around you, but you have to be clear about expectations even when you're uncertain that those expectations are correct. A lot of leaders get really fuzzy when things are uncertain because they don't want to be accountable. But as a leader, you have to create stability on your team, which means you have to be clear even when you're uncertain. So I would challenge you with what in your life right now, what in your leadership is uncertain where you need to provide clear direction for your team, clear expectations. So a couple of practices we can build. The first is to start circles. And what this means is getting groups of people together on a regular basis to talk about not just the work, but how we're doing the work. And it's a group of five to seven people, and you can ask three questions. Number one, what are you working on right now? Number two, what can we do to help you? What resources can we provide to help you with the work you're doing? And number three, this is important, what's inspiring you right now? What are you seeing, noticing, reading? What is it that's filling your well? Because we want to draw from that too. A very simple practice you can build into your organization or you can do outside of your organization with a group of peers, people from outside. But it's a great way to help you draw from the strength of others in your work. And the second practice is to engage in what I call a head-to-head, -head, which is basically choosing one other person and doing the same thing. Somebody you admire, somebody you'd want to see inside their notebook, and getting together with them on a regular basis and asking them to teach you something that they've learned since the last time you got together. And you're going to do the same thing. And you're filling one another's wells. Now, some of you are thinking, I don't even have time to see my family and my friends. And now you want me to meet with strangers? Once a month, what are you talking about? And again, I want to caution you, this isn't about efficiency. This is about effectiveness. You will make up that time on the back end, I guarantee it. But the reason we don't do things that are effective in the short term is because we're scared. We're scared they're not going to pay off. If you want to harvest, you have to plant the seeds. If you want, an, if you want a, the returns, you have to make the investment. Right? The third element of rhythm is energy. And this is about making sure that we're managing our ability to bring what Lewis Hyde calls emotional labor to the work that we do. And one practice we can do is to practice pruning. So in a vineyard, one of the primary roles of the vine keeper is to regularly prune areas of new growth. 
off the vine. Perfectly good fruit. Why would you prune perfectly good fruit off of a growing vine? Isn't that the goal of the vine? Well, yeah, but, but the vine keeper knows that if that new fruit isn't regularly pruned, it will eventually begin to steal resources from the older, more mature, fruit-bearing parts of the vine. And over time, the entire vine will succumb to systemic mediocrity because it's not wired to bear that much fruit. Well, as creatives, as leaders, as organizations, we don't struggle with new fruit on our vine. New ideas, new projects. We're terrible at saying no. We're terrible at pruning, creating white space for new ideas, new initiatives to emerge. So what in your life do you need to prune? What needs to go away? What really good thing needs to go away so that you can focus on the most important things, individually and as a leader? And then the second practice is to think whole life, which means basically we make commitments indiscriminately in every area of our life. We have to be good at interpreting how those commitments conflict with one another. So step back, look at your life, look at the commitments you've made, look at the things you've asked people on your team to do and ask, where am I issuing contradictory expectations or commitments to my team? And on an individual level, ask, where in my life are there contradictory expectations that are robbing my ability to bring my best to what is most important. Okay, brief overview of that. The fourth element is stimuli. These are all the things that go in our head that, that are the fodder, the raw materials for our creative process. But many of us are less than purposeful about the kinds of things we allow into our mind. Less than purposeful about the kinds of stimuli that inform our creative process. So, one practice that I would challenge you to implement is to define your list. Define your list. What does this mean? Came across a story in researching my, my new book of Roseanne Cash, who is a fantastic singer-songwriter and the daughter of Johnny Cash, the country music legend, one of my personal musical heroes. Right? And uh, there was a story from Roseanne's life when she was about 16 years old. And she and Johnny were standing around. And he was kind of quizzing her about country music. And he was aghast at how little she knew about country music, some of the greats of country music. And so uh, Johnny said, hold on, went over to the corner, took out a piece of paper, started writing. He came back and he handed her a piece of paper. And on that piece of paper was a list of the songs that he deemed to be the greatest songs in country music history. And he said, here, this is your education. Go learn these. Okay. And I think for any of us, there's something that could probably be considered our list. It's the set of resources we should be immersing ourselves in on a consistent basis, communing with great minds, sharpening our mind, this amazing tool that's between our ears. We have to be purposeful. It doesn't happen by accident. It only happens by design. So what is your list? Go to people you respect and ask, what's inspiring you? What's filling your well right now? And define your list. And the second thing, we've all heard this before, but do a stimulus dive. Put yourself in positions where you're experiencing the world in a new way. Right, so if you're an introvert, go to a dance club. If you're an extrovert, go to a museum and don't talk to anyone all day long. It's incredibly painful. But it's effective in, in causing you to think in new ways about the world. Right. Now, we've heard these things before. We know them. But it's not what you know, it's what you do that matters. Action defines reality, not knowledge. It doesn't matter what you know if you're not doing it. So are you doing it? The final element is ours. This is about where we put our time. Time is the currency of productivity, but often we default to an efficiency mindset in how we lead in ourselves rather than an effectiveness mindset. We have to learn to spend our time in ways that may be inefficient in the moment, but is truly effective in the long term. So simple practice I call unnecessary creating. I can't tell you how often I come into rooms of people like this with bright, sharp, amazing, talented creatives. And I ask, when was the last time you made something for yourself? Nobody was looking over your shoulder. Nobody was paying you. You did it sheerly for the love of making things. I can't tell you how often the answer is, I don't know. I can't remember the last time I made something just for me. See, we get into doing what we do because we love what we do. And over time, it becomes more about getting it done, making our paycheck, delivering client expectations, and we lose touch with our first love. So where in your life do you engage in unnecessary creating? It doesn't happen by default. It only happens by design. And then secondly, idea time. We all know ideas are important, but how many of us have time on our calendar dedicated to ourselves and our team generating ideas for our most important work? 
It often doesn't show up on our calendar, but where our calendar and our checkbook goes, that tells us what we really value. So we have to be disciplined about building time into our lives, more time than we think we need. And by the way, that's hard when we don't know who to bill. <laughs> but we have to do that. So it might mean coming in before work. It might mean staying a little late. It might mean a little bit of Sunday evening on the weekends work. But again, you will make it up in spades. All right. So focus, relationships, energy stimuli, hours. These are the five elements of rhythm. We need to individually be building practices. We need, as, a, to, to, as how we're leading our teams, we need to be building practices, rhythms in our teams as well to ensure that they have the space, the capacity to bring the fullness of who they are to what they do. That's what we do as leaders. We clear the space for our teams to be able to bring the fullness of who they are. But it takes courage to do that. And that's how we become prolific, brilliant, and healthy. Now, why? Why is this important? Right? Why is this important? I would submit to you this is critical. Structuring your life by design, not by default, is the only way to stem the tide, the oppressive tide, of the uncertainty of the creative marketplace. It is. Every single thing that you and I do on a daily basis is funneling up into what we could call a delta, a change, a body of work that exists because you and I sucked air on this earth. It's the sum total of value that we create. And it's not just our job, by the way. Our job's the most physical manifestation of our body of work. But it's any place in our life we add value. It's how we treat the barista at Starbucks. It's how we treat our friends. It's where we spend our money, our focus, our assets, our time, our energy. All of those things are funneling up into this body of work, this delta, this change that exists. And all of us, you and I, all of us in this room, we're going to point to that body of work at some point as we get near the end of our life, we're going to point to that body of work and ask, does that represent me? Does that represent what I really care about? Did I spend myself in a manner worthy of what I really care about? Or does that represent the whims, the wishes, the expectations of everybody around me? Does that represent the convenient path? Does it represent the easy path? Does it represent somebody else's priorities? We're each building a body of work whether we recognize it or not. And the reason this is important is because that big delta, that big body of work, is actually comprised of a lot of little deltas. Little choices that we make every single day of our lives about where we put our focus, our assets, our time, and our energy. And that doesn't happen by accident. It only happens by design, by purpose, strategically. Are you structuring your life in such a way that you're spending yourself on meaningful things? As Gretchen Rubin says, what you do every day matters more than what you do once in a while. So the guiding principle is this. Mediocrity, medius ochris, halfway up the rugged mountain. It doesn't just happen. Nobody wake, wakes up in the morning thinking, I can't wait to crank out a steaming pile of crap today. Nobody does that. But it happens. It happens in small ways over time. Little choices, those little deltas, how we choose to spend ourselves. Over time, they add up. Right? So that's why we have to be purposeful. So the countermanding principle is this. Brilliance demands discipline. But I would amend it to say this. Brilliance demands bravery. Bravery. Bravery to counteract the forces of the marketplace. Bravery to do the things that everybody tells you. You're crazy. You're crazy for doing that. That's incredibly inefficient. Yes. Yeah, but I'm aligning myself around the productive passion that matters to me. I'm spinning myself in ways that matter. And ultimately, I'm going to build a body of work that represents me, not that represents you. In order to do that, you have to find your voice. You have to find your voice. Your voice is what's being called out of you. Vocare, which means to call. It's what's being called out of you. What is being called out of you? And in the noise and the uncertainty and the craziness, you will not find that unless you're building purposeful practices into your life. So we have to notice how we're responding to our environment. And then we have to act in the direction of what we notice. So I'm going to give you a couple of points of traction to help you do that. What angers you? What angers you? Now, I'm not talking about road rage, by the way. Oh, you cut me off. No. I'm talking about compassionate anger. Compassion. To suffer with. To make suffering common. What fills you with compassionate anger? When you see something, you go, ah, somebody needs to do something about it. That is not right. That is not right. Somebody needs to do something about that. I recently had a, a great conversation with Judy John from Leo Burnett about the Like a Girl campaign, the Always Like a Girl campaign. And Judy was saying, 
when they were generating the ideas for that campaign, she said, every single one of us, when that idea came up, we all said, we have all done that. We have all used that phrase in a derogatory manner. We've all said, like a girl, in a derogatory way. Men, women, everyone. She's like, that is not right. It's not right. We have to reclaim that, right? It filled her with this kind of compassionate anger. So what fills you with compassionate anger? The second point of attraction is, what makes you cry? Or guys, what makes you feel like you have something in your eye, right? (laughs) What moves you emotionally? It's a great clue to your voice. I am profoundly moved by the stories of underdogs. People who, against all odds, have conquered. So I watched this movie, Rudy. Have you guys seen this movie about Notre Dame? Oh, oh my goodness, wow. Lots of Notre Dame people? I don't know. Movie Rudy, right? And you've got this little tiny guy who's on this football team. And you know, I'm in the basement. I'm watching it. My wife comes down. She's like, what are you doing? Why are you crying? Or why do you have lots of stuff in your eye? Why? Yeah, you've seen this movie a hundred times. I'm like, I know, but he's so small and he's playing so well and they're going to carry him off the field. It's beautiful, right? I am moved by the stories of underdogs. What moves you? What moves you with emotion? And how can you apply that in your work to help you build a body of work you can be proud of? What have you mastered? What do people come to you and say, how do you do that? And you're like, well, I don't know. It's obvious. It's obvious to you. It's not obvious to everybody. It's a great clue to your voice. And then finally, what gives you hope? Sulfur is falling from the sky. Cats and dogs are living together, but you're like, I think it's going to be okay, right? What fills you with irrational hope? Okay. One of my favorite thinkers, Thomas Merton, talked about this. He said, there could be an intense egoism in following everyone else. People are in a hurry to magnify themselves by imitating what is popular and too lazy to think of anything better. Hurry ruins saints as well as artists. They want quick success, and they're in such a hurry to get it, they cannot take time to be true to themselves. And when the madness is upon them, they argue that their very haste is a species of integrity. Do not let the forces of the marketplace rob you of your contribution, rob you of your voice. You have something important to contribute. Don't fall prey to the pressures that say, be like everybody else. This is the path. This is how you do it. Because you will look at a body of work that does not represent you. That's why since the beginning of our company, we've had a saying, cover bands don't change the world. And the cover band is a band that plays other people's music, and they fill clubs, and they make money. And at the end of the day, people go home remembering the music, not talking about the band. Make your own music. Make your own music. Don't be a cover band. We need you to be you. And each of us are depending on that happening. So one final thought. A couple of years ago, about a decade ago, a friend of mine was leading a meeting. He said, what do you think is the most valuable land in the world? I'm like, I don't know. That's a weird question. The most valuable land in the world. He said, well, go with me here. So we started throwing out guesses. Um, Gold mines of South Africa, wrong. Uh, Oil fields of the Middle East, wrong. Manhattan, wrong. Probably somewhere, probably some two-bedroom apartment in San Francisco, right? (laughs) Wrong. So finally, after a lot of guesses, we said, why don't you tell us? He said, well, my opinion, I think the most valuable land in the world is the graveyard. Graveyard. He said, yeah, because in the graveyard, are buried all of the unwritten novels, all of the unexecuted ideas, all of the unlaunched businesses, all of the bits of intuition people carried around with them their entire life, all of this value they had inside them, they carried it with them and they said, tomorrow I'm going to act on that. Tomorrow's the day I'm going to get around to that. Tomorrow I'm going to begin designing my life so I can get this stuff out into the world where it can be of value to other people. And they pushed it and they pushed it and they pushed it into the future until one day they reached the bookend of their life And all of that value was buried, dead in the ground, never to be seen by human eyes. You know, the death rate is hovering right around 100%. (laughs) And so that day I went back to my office and I wrote two words on an index card and I put them on the wall of my office and I put them in my notebook. And those two words have really defined the last decade of my life and they are die empty. Because I want to know when I reach the bookend of my life, I'm not taking my best work to the grave with me. I've been intentional every single day about those little deltas, building practices into my life and leading teams in such a way that I'm spending myself on work that matters. I'm not leaving my best stuff inside of me. I'm not taking it to the grave with me. So, friends, brilliant, amazing, talented creatives refuse to settle mediocres. Refuse to settle halfway up the rugged mountain. Structure your life with purpose and intent. Focus, relationships, energy, stimuli, hours. 
And if you are intentional, if you live by design, not by default, then someday in the far distant future, when you lay your head down for the last time, you can point to a delta, a body of work, and you can say, yes, that represents me. That represents what I care about. Not everybody else, that represents me. And you can die empty of regret, but full of satisfaction for a life well lived. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time.